okay? I mean, you can chat in the... Well, good morning and welcome to Gateway Church. Welcome to everybody who's here in the room. It's really good to see people. And if you are watching online, it's great to see you as well, although or for you to see us. Um, and it's great to be together. It's great if this is your first time watching our service. We are so, so welcome. And we'll share some ways that you can connect in with us um, a little bit later. But what I was, as I was preparing this morning, I just thought it'd be really good to just consider God in light of everything that was announced yesterday, last night, in light of all that has happened, that it'd be really good just to consider God and remind ourselves again of, of who we are as we come to worship, to, to not dwell on, on all the things that we've got going on in our minds now as we, as we look forward to the coming month, but to instead to fix our eyes on God. So I'm just going to read some verses from John chapter 1. So John chapter 1 verse 1 says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He, he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And then it goes down, and it says that the Word became flesh, and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. That as we come to worship this morning, we're coming to worship the God who was in the beginning, before all things, the creator God, the sustainer God, the God who without him nothing has been made, the God who is the life and the light of all mankind but also the God who came and dwelt amongst us. He is the God who is, who is big and creator and beyond our comprehension, but he's also the God who came near and dwelt amongst us. And for those of us who believe in Jesus, that we have seen his glory. So that as we worship this morning, we're coming to God to worship him for all that he is, as both the God who is great and the God who is near. So let's worship together. And let's worship. Shall we stand? I, I, I'm aware that you have, um, you know, we're, we're not all of us here can sing. And, and it's my first time for, um, to, for being in the room with everybody here. So I'm not even sure where to look, whether to look at the camera or to look at, at the, you guys. But so well, how about we, um, we, we look to um, we'll look to Jesus now and then um, we'll just sing, sing to you, sing from your soul, sing from your, um, sing from your heart. We shout to the north and the south, sing to and the West, Jesus is Savior to all, Lord of heaven and earth. We will shout to the north and the south, sing to the east and the west, Jesus is Savior to all, Lord of heaven and earth. Men of faith, rise up and sing. Great and glorious King, you are strong when you feel weak, in your brokenness complete. We will shout to the north and the south, sing to the east and the west, Jesus is Savior. Sing to broken hearts who can know the healing power of our awesome King of Love. We will shout to the north and the south, sing to the east and the west, Jesus is Savior. songs again of our God who reigns on high by his grace again we'll fly oh shout to the north and the south sing to the east and the west Jesus is Savior to all Lord of heaven and earth oh we've been to fire we've been to rain We've been re- 
defined by the power of his name. We fall in deeper in love with you. You burn the truth on our lips. Let's sing again. Oh, we've been through fire. We've been through rain. We've been refined by the power of his name. We fall in deeper in love with you. You burn the truth on our lips. south sing to the east and the west jesus the savior to all lord of heaven and God, thank you for being here. I just wanted to, um, while we go to our next song, I just wanted to share a bit of a psalm with you. I hope you're energized. It says, Psalm 57 says, My heart, O God, is steadfast. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make music. Awake my soul. I will awaken the dawn. I praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the sky. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. So even if you don't feel like singing this morning wherever you are, Lord, sing to your soul. Tell your soul to awaken in the presence of your Lord. Father God, we, we lift up our voices to you, Lord. We're going to sing, we're going to sing um, living hope now. Father God, hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Jesus. 
of your son, Lord. Thank you that we can look in you and that our hope is in you, Father God, despite what's going on in the world today, Lord, that our hope is in you. In the name of Jesus, Lord. Amen. In Christ alone, 
my hope is found he is my light my strength my song this cornerstone this solid ground firm through the fiercest drought and storm what heights of love what depths of peace when fears are still when striving cease my comforter my all in all here in the love of christ i'll stand song last week, Sarah did it an amazing justice and um, it's, it's, it's quite a powerful song if any of you have seen the um, Maverick City we've done it and um, we'll do our best to do it justice because they just blow it out of the water but this particular pre-chorus is very important I think for right now it says that though the storms may come though the winds may blow I'll remain steadfast and let my heart learn, when you speak a word, it will come to pass. Lord, we thank you for your promises. We thank you that when things are difficult, we can go back to your word and we can stand on the promises that you 
speak so clearly over us. And Lord, in this time, um, we need that more than ever. So Father, I just pray that as we sing this song to you, that it would remind our hearts. God of Abraham, you're the God of covenants, the faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven, you do just what you say. setting same I will praise your name great is your faithfulness to me to age, so the earth may pass away, your word remains the same, yeah. your history can prove, there's nothing you can't do, you're faithful and true.
faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground, my hope and firm foundation. He'll never let me down. Let's just take a moment and just to allow that verse just to resonate in our hearts. And we are the people that put our faith in Jesus, who's, who's our anchor, our hope, and our firm foundation. He's not going to let us down. Things may not go the way we want them to, but God is faithful to every single one of his promises. He has finished what he has accomplished on the cross, and he's coming back to fulfill every single thing he's ever said he's going to do. It's a firm foundation, the only hope that we have. I'm just going to pray. Well, I'm going to pray from um, the words of, of 1 Peter, um, verses, verses 3 to, to 6. And as we pray this together, let's be reminded again of the great faithfulness of God to us in Jesus. So blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to your great mercy, you have caused us to be born again to a living hope through the rever- resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading kept in heaven for us who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this we rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, we've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of our faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He has done it. It is finished. He is with us. He is for us. He is faithful to us. So we're going to end our time of worship there. Thank you so much to the band and and the way that you guys have served us. Um, It was lovely just to worship God together. I'm going to run through a couple of notices um, now, and then we're going to go into our two-minute pause, okay? So the first one is to to say welcome again. Welcome to everyone in the room. Welcome to everyone watching online. If you're watching on one of the repeats um, of this, it is so good to have you with us. Um, If you're new to Gateway, we'd love to connect with you. We'd love to hear from you. And the best, one of the best ways of doing that is if you're watching church online now, is is to click on the get connected button um, or to to type something in the chat and someone from the church will, will contact you and be able to get in touch with you. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to get to know you a bit um, and for you to get to know us a bit as well. For those of us who are members of Gateway, um, there's a date for our diaries. So we will be meeting together online on Sunday the 8th of November at 8 p.m. and where we'll be sharing some key information for the church and how things are going to be moving forward into 2021. So check your emails for that Zoom link so that you can be part of that meeting and and hearing what God is going to be doing um, with us over the coming year. And lastly, um, before we go into our two-minute break, um, before the talk this morning, we're just going to go into a quick video um, for about the Together exhibition. If, if people are sitting and wondering whether why we've not addressed kind of what's coming up over the next few weeks after what was announced um, kind of yesterday, Barney's going to go into that um, sort of thing as, as he starts to speak. So don't worry, we're, we're, we're getting there. Um, but yeah, so we're just going to go into our, 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 our video now about the Together exhibition, and then we're going to take our two-minute pause. Um, and so we'll see you really shortly. We would like to remind you about the Together Exhibition, which is about what being together means to you. Please submit your work, whether it's a photo, painting, film or craft, by email or in person to Debbie by the end of November. We look forward to displaying submissions on Sunday mornings and at the Riverside. Stop here.
chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you might proclaim the mighty hearts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light, 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 into his marvellous light. Would that, would that help? Well, good morning and welcome to you. Uh, it's great. Thank you so much. See, this is why we have people in the room, because it, it, it makes it great and an encouragement. Thanks, guys. That was great. Um, so as I said, uh, as I was saying to myself, clearly, <laughs> and to you guys, you all heard me, because I've got a loud teacher's style voice. Um, as I was saying, it is great to have you with us today. If it's your first time with us, welcome to you. If, it's, uh, if you've been coming along a while, please do feel free to connect in with us. Uh, yesterday uh, afternoon, evening, Boris Johnson made that announcement about the coming weeks. And as yet, we need to just kind of get some detail on what the shape of that is for us as a church and how we uh, do the next month together. And so what I'm going to be doing is we've got a leaders meeting after the, the service today. So please be praying for us for wisdom. Obviously, we've got guidance that we need to adhere to and follow. And what I'm intending to do is communicate to you uh, with some clarity in the next sort of 24 to 48 hours what we will be doing as we uh, go into this lockdown 2.0, as it's being called, um, and we'll see where we go from there. Um, but please uh, be, uh, be kind of be encouraged today. I hope that the worship guys were so encouraging this morning. Thank you. Look, 
we, it's all about Jesus. We're here because of him. I said this a couple of weeks ago. We're going to carry on doing that. And okay, the shape will change again in the next few weeks, but that's okay because we'll come back together again. And it is our intention that what you see right now will become our default. So obviously we might have to go back to not having people in the room or having something pre-recorded, but we will be putting something out to you each week uh, throughout the next few weeks. Um, now, I have uh, uh, to apologise to you because obviously uh, I haven't got the great production value of last week's talk. Um, Andy, you really kind of put me to shame here. So, I, I, you know, I was thinking about speaking to John Budd about seeing if we could put some sort of like islands behind me or a space scene or some sort of sci-fi thing. Uh, but uh, alas, I ran out of time. So you've just got me on stage today. So I'm hoping that my content is, uh, is interesting enough for you to keep you interested. Andy, it was really great last week. And Ash, thank you so much for all that you put into that. It was a real blessing to all of us. Uh, a few weeks ago, so we're halfway through now. So we uh, are halfway through our series on being together. And you just heard those verses at the start from First Peter about the fact that we are a chosen people called to Together by God. And so over the last few weeks, we've looked at a few different things. I started the series by talking about the fact that we are made by God for relationship and community, which is why this is such a difficult day for us, right? Because you're made for community and relationship. And so when the government tell us that we can't have community in the way that we would normally, that's difficult for us because we're made, we're hardwired by God for connection with other people. And so when we find that we can't do that, that's painful for us because why? Well, we were made for community. So I spoke about that, and then over the last three weeks, we've looked at different things we do as a church and why we do them. So we've looked at why do we preach? Why, why do we do what I'm doing right now? We've looked at why we worship together. We've looked at why we pray together. And all of these things have been with the intention of helping you to understand that actually as we kind of aren't able to do church in our normal way where everybody's here and it's just an amazing, mad sort of like family time, that at the moment, we, look, we need to carry on doing the things that we, we have to do because we need to do them. And we need to do them because that's what keeps us together as the people of God. Um, but one thing I realized I didn't really cover, and that is what the church really is. And so today, I think it's a really opportune moment for me to cover what the church is. Um, if we can pop that slide back off for the moment, because I'll get to that in a few minutes' time. Um, look, genuinely, as I started preparing this, I've, I've had a pretty hard week this, this week. Um, not even just because of yesterday. I've just had a hard week. And I, I think for, for many of us, we've kind of gone up and down emotionally throughout the last kind of weeks and months. And this week for me has been a bit of an emotional down for me. I'm going to be honest with you about that. I felt a bit kind of frustrated about COVID. Really frustrated. I'm really fed up with it. I never assumed. So um, the 10th of November last year was the, the day that the, the, the eldership team, I took over the lead of the eldership team. So we're now coming up. So next Sunday will be a year to the day that I took over um, the eldership team. I never assumed that the first year of leading a church would be like this. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it is just what it is. Thanks, Lord. Um, and I'm fed up with it. I am fed up with it. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But as I, became, as I came to prepare this, and I remembered what I'm speaking on, it was like all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, Jesus, thank you. Because today we're going to talk about the church. And now I can get passionate about lots of things. I'm kind of one of those people, like, I, I get enthusiastic about anything. Um, and I like sharing my opinions about absolutely everything. Ask anybody on our staff team, they'll tell you that. But the church is right up there for me. As being like the, the, one of the, the main things I love to talk about. I said to Claire what I'm talking about. She, she said, oh, you'll have no problem talking about that. Um, I love talking about the church. And that's probably a good thing, given that's my job, right? Um, but my job today, I really believe my job today is for you in the room and you at home. I want to stir your passion for the church today. Because, look, there's something about this organization that God has created that is going to help sustain us and give us enthusiasm and encouragement as we hit lockdown number two. But let me get into a couple of things first before we put those things up. We're not going to put them up yet, but when, when we get there, it, let me just give you a few things that church is not, first of all. Church isn't a social club, okay? So I'm just going to just want to communicate these things to you because these are quite important in me being able to communicate what I want to say. Church isn't a, a social club. So in our culture, it would be easy to assume that you could just come along to church and it would act like any kind of other social gathering that you might turn up to. So, okay, I can be a gym member or I can be a member of X club or Y club. And I go along to those things and it gives me social connection with other people. Um, I worked with a guy a couple of years ago and this is this this. Uh, phrase really wound me up to the point so I've probably shared it with you before but I'll share it again 
So he said to me, because he, he really didn't like Christians. So he said to me, well, because he was into Warhammer, and he would go off and do Warhammer kind of like conventions every weekend, go and play like, like weekend long games. And one day he said to me, well, you've got your hobby and I've got mine. And I said, church isn't a hobby. Like it's just not, it's not the same thing. But it's really easy in our culture to assume that church is just a social club. Secondly, church is not a community organization or project. It's not. William Temple once said that the church exists primarily for the sake of those who are still outside of it. He was the Archbishop of uh, Canterbury uh, a long time ago. And that statement gets used a lot. And it's a true statement. The church exists for the benefit of those people who are no, not yet part of it. That's what we're here for. But there is a danger that the church can end up just being seen as another charity. We live in an age of altruism. That means doing good works. So you'll see it everywhere. The generation coming up below me, millennials and, and those even below them, are, are, are being kind of encouraged to live in a lifestyle that encourages good works. Good works are good. It's good to do good to other people. You saw that in the first lockdown. We had the clapping for the NHS and loving your neighbor and all these non-Christians doing amazing things. Look, everybody can be good to one another. But we can be mistaken if we're not careful for thinking that is all that the church should be about as well. We can make that mistake of thinking it's just about doing good works to other people. It's just a charity, effectively. Thirdly, we could be mistaken for thinking that church is an event. And this is the real danger of the situation that we're in at the moment. So you come along on Sundays, you click on it. It's an event that you just turn up to each week. Before lockdown, before this all started, thinking back to January this year, I know that feels like a lifetime ago, but you might have said to your friends, oh, what are you doing this weekend? And, and, and you say, oh, I'm going to church. Because it's an event that you go to. Or you might even, you know, and I think this gets heightened by um, churches like Hillsong, for example, or other great churches doing amazing things. And their production value is so high, it almost feels like you're going to Beyonce concert when you turn up to it. It becomes an event. And the danger is we could end up seeing church as an event that we go to. Fourthly, church is not an obligation. You don't have to come. We are not a cult. We are not going to force you to come along to church. We are not going to beat you over the head with dry religion and tell you you have to come to church every week. We're not going to try and uh, push you to come along to something you don't want to come along to and make you feel guilty about it when you don't because that is not what we are about. This is not an obligation. Perhaps you were brought up in an environment where attendance was expected. The pastor was heavy-handed with his flock, making them come along every week. You must come, otherwise God won't like you anymore. Now, joy and love and passion for something are not created in environments of obligation and fear. That doesn't, it doesn't happen. How does it happen? Actually, it happens when we, we realize the true value of it and we are encouraged to come along. You see, actually, God, when God comes and steps into the world in Christ, he puts an end to the law with its list of rules and regulations and brings us grace. We're free to follow God. We're free to come. And when we know the value of it, we'll come because we want to come. Why? Because grace enables us to say yes. Now, I could come up with lots of other reasons why what, of what church isn't, but I've just given you those as a, just a brief overview, really, just to help you understand a little bit about um, what, what, what we are not. Because you, you need to be aware, you see, if you lose sight of what we are, you can end up making up something about what church is that it isn't. So here's my seven things. Um, in, in, here's my seven things that I'm going to go through in a, in a second. You want to pop them up on the screen really quickly and then pop them back off again. In a, in a second, I'm going to go through these seven points with you. But before I do that, I'm going to say one more thing. So you can turn them back off again now. I'm going to say one more thing. People try and separate out Jesus and church. I've heard pastors do that with me. So I, 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 I was chatting to uh, one pastor at once from another church. And I was talking about how great the church is. And I said, I, said I, I used the phrase, I could talk all day long about church. And they said, yeah, but it's really all about Jesus, isn't it? And people try and separate out church from Jesus. Like, you can separate them out. Um, and and th th that's a lot easier in, in a culture and an environment where everything's individualized. So for most of us, we were brought into faith by an individual form of uh, repentance. So you were told quite rightly that you need to repent of your sins and, and so that you can be forgiven by God. So you were told that actually you needed to accept Jesus as your saviour and your Lord as an individual. 
But unless that's tagged onto this whole idea of so that you come as a big part of the family of God, you miss sight of part of God's great salvation plan. If you just think it's about you and your personal salvation, you miss part of God's great plan for you. You can't separate out Jesus from church. Why? Let me read you this from Ephesians 5. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her in order to make her holy by cleansing her with the washing of water by the word, so as to present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or anything of the kind. Jesus loves the church. Jesus loves the church. He loves the church. He loves it. Enough to give himself over to death for it. Jesus loves the church. Paul here is writing about Christ and the church, but he's using the analogy of marriage. And he talks about husbands, lay down your life for your wives, just as Christ laid down his life for the church. Jesus loves the church. Now, I love Jesus. And there was a, Oswald Chambers wrote a book that the title was My Utmost for His Highest. That would be my heart in all that I do. I'm going to give my utmost for God's glory. And so if Jesus loves something, well, then I'm going to love it too. Jesus loved the poor, so I'll love the poor. Jesus loved the outcast, so look, I'm going to go to the outcast. Jesus loves the church. Maybe you need to hear that this morning. If you want to follow Jesus, individual Christianity is not going to do it for you. Because Jesus loves the church. If you want to follow Jesus, you'll develop a love for the church. This is not an either-or argument. You can't strain the church out of Christianity like straining out tea bags from a cup of tea. You can't do it. You can't strain them out. Why? Because Jesus loves it. It's Jesus' first love. And this is my first point. You can put them up on the screen now. I've teased you twice already. Right, the first point is this. You see, what, what is the church then? Well, look, the church is Christ's bride. We are Christ's bride. Jesus loves the church. Why? Because we are his bride. Now, this is a strange concept to some of us, isn't it? Gentlemen in the room, imagine the fact that one day you are going to be married to Jesus. That is a strange thing for some of us to consider. When we see Jesus referring to himself as the bridegroom, for some of us, that can be quite difficult. However, this is what we see in the Bible. So in Matthew, uh, we see Jesus talking about the bridegroom coming back again. We see it in the parables quite, quite a lot, actually. And then in Revelation, we see that as he returns, he comes for the bride. The groom is coming. That's what the, the picture in the New Testament is, that the groom is coming back again for his bride. And there's going to be a day when he returns, is a day when a great wedding is going to take place. Jesus gets united with his bride, the church, forever. And it's a perfect marriage. Jesus is going to be the perfect husband. It's not going to be like an earthly marriage where things go wrong and things aren't ever perfect. It's going to be a perfect marriage between Christ and the church. And what we need to understand about this is it's not Christ and us as individuals. Jesus isn't being married to you as an individual. He's being married to us as the church. Some of us will find that difficult because of the Western environment that we live in. That it's all about the individual. But Jesus is coming for us as the church. So right now, we are betrothed to the King of Kings. We are living in the time of engagement. Wow, that was a great time in my life, uh, you know, understanding that now. But we are living in the time of engagement, the, the excitement, the tension of what's going to come when we hit marriage. We are betrothed to the King of Kings. You and I, we're betrothed to him. You remember William and Kate, they got married. And when uh, Kate got married to uh, William, she wasn't really anybody, was she? No, I didn't know who she was before she got engaged to William. But all of a sudden, overnight, Kate went from being pretty much a nobody, in terms of the eyes of, 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 of the population, to one of the most famous people in the world. How much more, then, for us, who are betrothed not to the future king of England, but the king of kings, it, are we important? Think about that for a second. How much more important are we that we are betrothed to the king of kings? Too often, you underestimate how important the church is. I do as well. We all do it. We underestimate the importance of what we are engaged in. And so today, I'm speaking on this to encourage you, to exhort you again to say, God, would you stir my passion for this? Number two, we are Christ's body. This is the second way that we are the church. What does this church look like? Well, we're the Christ body. In Ephesians 4 and 1 Corinthians 11, Paul paints a picture of the church as a body. 
And it's like a multi-layered analogy. You can keep finding different meanings in it. But let me just give you two uh, layers to this analogy. First of all, Christ is the head of the church. Okay, so imagine that Christ is the head. We are his body. We are his hands and feet going out into the world, doing Christ's will. Just as my hands do what my head tells them to do, so with Christ and us, we go out doing what Christ has instructed us to do. Secondly, this is the second part of this analogy. In, in a body, everything is important. Every part matters. You matter. Every one of you in this room matters. Everyone watching at home or you watching later on in the week, you all matter. We all matter in this body. The legs can't start a protest against the feet and say, well, look, actually, feet, we're a bit fed up with you. We want a third leg. They, they can't do that. Why? Because they need the feet and the feet need the legs. That The hands can't start fighting with one another. Every part of the body is important. Every part is useful. And in the same way, each of us in this church community is important. Each one of you has an individual role to play. Some of those roles will be up the front. Some of those roles will be hidden and never seen up the front. And those are the roles that God celebrates the most. But we all have an important role to play. Maybe you have been coming along to Gateway for a while, but you've not really got involved. Look, if you get involved, we're able to do things that we've never been able to do if you weren't involved. You, you, you being part of the body makes us better. You know, it's like all of a sudden we go, oh my goodness, we've got a thumb. We can do things we couldn't do before. We can lift this, we can do that. Why? Because all of a sudden we've got something we didn't have before. You being part of the body makes this body better. Don't rob us of your gifting before God. Because if you're part of the body, you will make it better. You have an important role to play. Thirdly, we're God's family. We're God's family. That's who we are as the church. So I've said this a couple of times already. We live in a culture that celebrates the individual and individualism. Yet as the church, we are a family. You see, we've, we, this has been noted more than, I would say, anything throughout COVID. It, we, the, 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 the interesting thing that you get in the media over the last few years is this whole thing about celebrating the individual. It's all about the individual. It's all about you being your best you, living your best life as an individual. Buy more, get more stuff, be happy by doing those things. And then we hit COVID and everybody realizes that they need other people. Oh my goodness, I actually need my neighbor. Oh my goodness, I need my family. I need my friends. Because we've created this system as a culture that doesn't actually work in practice. We need the church. The church is the family of God. In families, in a good family, you will belong. In a good family, you can get things wrong and it doesn't matter. So you can come and bring something up the front and get it wrong. It doesn't matter. You know, sometimes I will quote the wrong Bible verse. It doesn't matter. We get things wrong from time to time. But in a family, we move past it. In a family, we're loved for who we are, not who we're not. Yeah, we love, we love people for who they are rather than who they're not. I could wish all sorts of things on members of my family and wish they're things that they're not, but they are who God's made them to be and growing in those, those characters. And I need to love them for who they are and celebrate who God has made them and who God is making them to be rather than stumbling over who I wish they were. And it's the same in the church family. We can celebrate and love people for who we are. So we're God's family. That's number three. Number four, we are one new man in Jesus Ephesians 2 and 1 Corinthians 11 talks about, the, 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 sorry, sorry, Ephesians 2 talks about, see, I've done it already, I've got the wrong verse. Ephesians 2 talks about the fact that God has reconciled Jew and Gentile in Christ. That in his body, he has made two that were separate one. He has made one new man in him because of the cross. Now, in our culture, we don't really have the issue of Jew and Gentile. It's not an issue we really have anymore. We have an issue, though, over diversity. So we have an issue over the fact that in our culture, we have lots of different nationalities, people from races, different backgrounds, social, economic backgrounds, so rich and poor, as well as what, what you look like, what your skin color is. And the challenge for us is the fact that we need to understand that we can get along as a diverse church. I don't believe that God's best for us as a church community is just to be white British. I don't believe that God's best for us as a church is to be black British. I believe God's best for us as a church is to be diverse. So every church, I believe, should represent what their local population looks like. So if we lived in an area where there were only black people, then I expect our church to be mainly only black. If we lived in a church, if we live in an area like Ashford where we've got lots of nationality, well, then our heart should be, hey, we want every nationality 
living in this area to be represented in this body. Why? Because we speak something back to the divisions in culture about what true family looks like, about what true diversity looks like. And we don't ignore people's cultures. We celebrate them together. We celebrate one another. So we can celebrate being British. We don't do that often. We can celebrate being from whatever nation we're from. And we should be celebrating and valuing one another's cultures and honouring them. I was going to say this as well from 1 Corinthians 11. Paul writes about the body. He says, when one part suffers, all suffer along with it. And so going back a few months to George Floyd, that was my heart. Look, I don't understand all of the issues attached to race because I'm not black. But I can suffer along with those who are suffering. I can care along with those who are caring. Why? Because I belong to the body and we belong to a diverse body. God loves difference. He loves uniqueness. And we're called to celebrate that uniqueness in our togetherness. Number five, we are a proclamation of God's salvation. This is a bit of a, 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 I could get into a minefield here, but I'm going to try and make this as easy to understand as possible. Ephesians 3 says this, to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden hidden for in ages in God who created all things. So that through the church, so that through the church, you need to hear that one, that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. So this could be really complicated, but let me try and make it as simple as possible. What Paul is saying here is this. In eternity past, in eternity past, God not only chose you, because you can take the Bible and go, okay, the Bible says that I was chosen before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined me to be his son or his daughter. That's what Paul writes. We could just take it as the individual, but Paul's saying something more here. In eternity past, God chose the church to be his instrument in declaring the noise about his saving work. So God chose the church, almost like a a, a trumpet or a guitar, to make the noise about what he's done. And as we as the church function, we not only declare this amazing work of God's salvation to the world around us, we're declaring it to powers and principalities in heavenly places that you and I can't even begin to understand and we shouldn't even try to understand. But as we do what we do here on a Sunday, we are declaring the good news, God's saving work to all of creation and all beyond what we can see. This is amazing. Our coming together was preordained so that God's salvation might be made known. The act of coming together is proclaiming his amazing grace to all of salvation. You need to take hold of that. This demonstrates how important this organization is, how important this family is. You see, we're not just kind of a collection of people. We're coming together to do something that was preordained by God before the creation of the world. That's incredible. And we need to take hold of it. Number six, we are in the business of life change. We're in the business of life change. The the Great Commission was for a group of ex-fishermen and tax collectors and prostitutes radically changed by their time with Jesus to go into all the world and make disciples. Jesus met with them, Matthew 28, and he gave them a commission. Go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them. The disciples were tasked to go out and make more disciples. These changed individuals were were called to go out and change others. You've been changed, Jesus was saying to this group, by, by, by my presence with you. By my power at work within you, you have been changed. Now go out and make change. Go out and be change makers for others. Go out and transform others. These changed people were called to go and be changers of others. Isaiah 61. Now, the week before lockdown number one, we can call it that now, can't we? The week before lockdown number one, I spoke a message that to me was quite important, but I think it got lost a little bit in everything. I spoke on Isaiah 61. And I spoke about the fact that actually we as the church are called to be like uh, Isaiah 61. We're called to take people from brokenness to restoration. We're called to take people from ruin to royalty was the title of the message. Because Isaiah 61 talks about this broken and despairing people. Beauty for ashes, it says. A garment of praise instead of despair. And then it talks about going from ruin to oaks of righteousness. That's what we should be doing as the church. As you journey with us as Gateway Church, you should be growing more like Jesus, 
Growing in holiness, growing in goodness, growing in confidence in your identity, be able to step out in what God's called you to be, growing in him. This church should be a place where we bring about change, change in people's lives. That's what we're about. We're about life change. Why? Because that's what Jesus did. He took this ragtag group of people and he showed them the kingdom of God. He showed them himself and they were changed. We're called to bring people to Jesus that he would do the same in them. And lastly, point seven, we are heralds of the kingdom. We've got a mandate as a church to go out and to declare. I've used these phrases before, words, works, and wonders. Every time we step out of the house, we should be looking to declare something of the goodness of God's kingdom. The church is God's plan for the proclamation of his gospel in the world. That's what Ephesians 3 is talking about. We are God's plan. I said this in the prayer meeting before, before today, but this is really important. You need to understand this. When we talk about coronavirus, everybody's going, what is God doing in this? Jesus is pointing at the church and going, I'm doing this. You're looking around the world. What is God doing? God's pointing at the church and going, there's my plan. This is my plan. Here's my plan. It's the church. It's nothing else. You see, actually, we are the church is God's plan for the salvation of all things. It's through us that it happens. It's through you, through me, through us as a church that the manifold wisdom of God is being made known. It's through us. You need to hear that because often what happens is, is we, can, we can just sort of step away from it and think, well, the church isn't really important. It's, it's something I go to on Sunday. I'll just live with my individual form of Christianity. No, 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 no. The church is God's plan. So when you start looking around and going, well, what's God doing? Look to the church. Yeah, God is refining us. God is shaping us. God's probably rubbing away some rough edges from us. But God's doing something at this time. I'm just reminded of an image that's coming to my mind right now of a fire. And so I've start, we've started having our, our, our log fire going again at home because it's getting a, bit, getting a bit chilly, isn't it, at night? And, um, and last night I, I went to the fire and, and the log on the surface looked black. And I prodded it with a poker and all, under, all, all the black fell away. And underneath it was just, it was red hot. You know, actually, what God's doing in coronavirus to us as his people is knocking away all the bits that are dead. And what he's doing is he's pushing in just heat and life and new energy. Allow God to do the work of refining you in the next four weeks because we are the plan. We are the plan. You are part of the plan. So here's the application this morning. So... Maybe for you, you need to just recognize a little bit of what I've been saying this morning, that the world needs the church, and it needs you to be part of it. Maybe for you, you need to reignite. You need to ask God, just, would you reignite my passion for the church? Maybe you just need to recommit your heart again to God today. I've got this wrong a little bit. I'm, I'm thinking that the church is something it isn't. So there's the three things for us as gateway. God, would you stir my affections for this group of people? God, would you stir my affections for your purpose and plan in the church, in this world? But lastly, let me just say this. Um, maybe you haven't been attending church ever before, and over lockdown, you've started to look on in on different churches, and you found us maybe today, maybe you've been coming on a while. We've had prophetic words about people coming that we don't even know about yet, and so I know that there are people here watching us who haven't connected with us yet. I just want to invite you to come and be part of us. Come and be part of us. We're a local church. I believe, I believe that the local church is the hope of all the world. We want to be a church that is local to Ashford. We've not got a big dream to change London. We've got a dream to see Ashford changed with the kingdom of God and the glory of God. But we know that as we do that, God will touch all of Kent and the ends of the earth. Because as we have this plan and know that God's called us to Ashford, as we see people transformed in Ashford, they will go out and change the world. We believe God's got a purpose and a plan for us as a church. Even now, even after Boris's announcement yesterday, God has got a plan for us and a purpose for us as a church. Don't, don't take your eye off the prize. Don't take your eye off the prize today. God's doing something special with us. And I'd love for you, we'd love for you to be part of what God's doing here. There's this um, story in Numbers. Moses and the Israelites are leaving Sinai. And he's imploring his brother-in-law, Hobab. It's a great name, isn't it? Hobab to go with them. And he says to him, we are setting out for the place of which the Lord said, I will give it to you. Come with us and we will do good to you. For the Lord has promised good to Israel. So here's my invite to you today. If you don't, haven't stepped in on us before, come with us. We will do good to you. 
We will do good to you. We're not always going to get it right because we're a family. And families get things wrong. But I promise you this. We will do good to you. We will do good to you. This year has been unexpected, hasn't it? It's been challenging. And it's been unique. But in all the uncertainty, I am totally certain of the church. I'm certain that in the church, the hope of all of the world is here. And that God is using us for his divine, eternal purposes to bring all things together in Christ. And we need to have that confidence, church, as we step out into the next four weeks. Whatever that looks like for us, we believe in the church. The church is the answer. So should we stand? We're going to worship together as we finish today. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your blood shed on the cross. Thank you for the amazing worship songs this morning. Lord, it is all about you. But Lord, you are head of the church and we, your body, are called to make known your greatness to the world around us. And so, Lord, we pray. We don't know what this week's going to bring because we don't know day to day at the moment, but we do know you and we know your plan. We know that your plan is being fulfilled through us, your church. And so, Lord, I pray, breathe confidence in us today. Spirit, come reignite passion today. Spirit, come reignite uh, uh, maybe a lost love for your people. Spirit, come encourage and enthuse now as we close our meeting, worshipping together, I pray. Amen. 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 Brian said, um, lockdown isn't going to stop God building his kingdom. And we're going to sing about that now. We're going to sing. We're going to remind ourselves that we are his church. And our church, the church isn't closed. The church isn't going to be going to be closed and we're going to continue we're going to grow i'm going to kind of continue to build into god and to um to extend his kingdom and his name so so let's sing come set your rule and reign in our hearts again increase in us we pray unveil why we're made come set our hearts ablaze with hope like wildfire in our very souls holy spirit come invade us now we are your church we need your power in us we seek your kingdom first kingdom's power reaching the near and far no force of hell can stop your beauty changing hearts you made us for much more than this awake the kingdom seed in us fill us with a strength and love of christ we are your church we are the hope Great. Come on, we need to be praying for this this week. God, put a fire and passion in my heart for church. Put a fire and passion in my heart for the things of God. Come build your kingdom here. That's what we want to be praying this week, folks. No matter what we're doing, no matter what happens this week, let's get before God. Build your kingdom in my life. 
build your kingdom through this church. Because we are going to come out of this. We'll walk through. I've said it before. You just need to keep your eye on the prize, folks. We will walk through this and come out the other side of it. And let's be praying that as we do that, we are stirred with a passion and a hunger like we've never had before for the purpose and kingdom of God, that we see God's purposes done in our generation. You know, that before we kick the bucket or Christ returns, we know that Christ has fulfilled his purpose for us because we've given everything we can to the kingdom of God. Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you. We thank you for the encouraging worship this morning. Lord, we pray, Lord, as we walk out into this week, God, bless us, your church. Lord, that we would be a light to the darkness. Lord, that we would be hope to the hopeless. Lord, that you would use us to bring words, works, and wonders to the world around us. Even if we end up stuck at home on Thursday, Friday, and the four weeks ahead, Lord, that we would be able to demonstrate your kingdom to those around us, I pray. Amen. 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 Thanks for joining us. Looking forward to seeing you again next week.